All right, day three of eighth grade math assessment practice. Please have your paper, pencil, and calculator out and ready to go. Your first question begins now. We want to know what is the value of the 7 in this number, 24.735. Here's the 7. What's the actual value? Well, this is the tenths place. So we're actually saying this is 7 tenths. So as clear as I can make it, that is 7 tenths of a whole number, or 7 tenths of 1. If you just to kind of reiterate this, if that's the hundredth place, then that would be equivalent to three one hundredths. And if this was the thousandth place, that's equivalent to five one thousandths. But that's that's kind of just knowing that fact. The choice is A. All right, probability question. You've got sixty seconds to solve, starting now. A basket of fruit contains four apples, six oranges, five plums. Deanna chooses two pieces of fruit without replacing her first choice. That's important. What is the probability she will first choose an orange? Okay, so two things we need. We need the total pieces of fruit. So if we add these up, 4 plus 6 plus 5, we've got 15 total pieces. Um, how many oranges are there? Well, there's 6. So 6 of those 15 um, were oranges. It turns out in this particular question, this other piece of information, like the fact that she chooses two and doesn't replace the first one, is extra. So the only probability at play here is the first pick, she has a 6 out of 15. Notice that's not over here. So did we do it wrong, or what did we miss? The answer is we did not reduce this to its uh, lowest common denominator. So if we divide both by 3, um, this reduces down to two out of every five chances would be a an orange at least on the first try so letter A is our choice next question probability round two ready begin
restaurant offers three kinds of drinks, four types of dinner, and two kinds of desserts. How many different combinations of a drink, a dinner, and a dessert could you order? So this would be a common choice. I mean, there's lots of different choices when you go to a restaurant, and how can we quickly get to the answer here? I mean, there's lots of different combinations. So I'll give you a 30-second lesson on probability. If I've got three different drink choices and four different uh, dinner specials, we'll just call it S right now, and two different desserts, uh, we'll call it uh, uh, DE. Think of it this way. I could have this drink with this this combination. I could have 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 this combination. And it really just gets complicated from there. So there's lots of different choices. The fastest way is, well, we've got three choices at drink times four choices at dinner special times two choices at dessert. That gives us 24 total combinations, and that is choice B. And that's how you quickly get to those total number of combinations. Probability, round three, 60 seconds, begin. Okay, so we got a number cube and a spinner used in a game. The spinner has an equal chance of landing on one of five colors, red, blue, green, orange. So I'm thinking some type of a game where we have different wedges where there's different colors. And you can kind of imagine with me what that looks like. I can't draw very good, but there's here's my choices. And I have a cube that has one, two, three, four, five, six. I want to know what are the, what's the probability that I could uh, spin a red and get a six. Um, well, it's two independent events, so there's a one in five chance I'm going to get red. So there's one red wedge out of five, and there's a one in six chance that I'm going to get a six since there's six possibilities here. So how are these related? How can I use them? So when you do have two independent events, you multiply them together. So one fifth times one sixth will actually give me one in thirty. So there's actually a one in thirty probability that I will spin a red and get a six, and that matches here with choice A. Next question. Check it out. You've got sixty seconds to complete it. Model airplane shown below 
has a scale of three quarter inch equals two feet. What is the length of the actual plane? Um, well, if the model is 14 and a half inches, we need to convert over to actual feet. So we start by writing three quarters of an inch to every two feet equals the length of our model, 14 and one quarter inches over some unknown number of feet, which we'll call x. Um, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because um, we've got fractions and things like that. Uh, there's a couple ways we could approach it, but ultimately we have to cross multiply and divide and come up with the correct answer here. Um, the first part, we have 3 fourths times x equals 2 times 14 and a quarter. Um, I don't know that you can do that in your head, but it's 28 and a half. The problem is with fractions is once you get them onto calculators, they're not that easy to do. So I actually changed that to 28.5. Um, and three quarters, if you don't know, if you take three divided by four on your calculator, you'll find that that is 0.75x. So depending on where you are, you have to get this into decimal form if you hope to solve it quickly. Um, so that would be converting, so you could go back and convert these fractions. This would be 0.75 inches and this would be 14.25. Once we get those in decimal form, this, uh, this problem goes a lot faster. But I end up taking both sides divided by 0 0.75 and 28.5 divided by 0 0.75 will give me 38 feet. And we're hoping that's a choice, and it is. So this one, it's tricky. What were the keys here? Um, Fractions, difficult to work with, convert them into decimal, which I did here and here, and then cross multiply and divide, set up the ratios. Um, but like I said, you'll probably get into trouble if you start trying to multiply fractions, divide by fractions. It's just going to be difficult. Next question, 60 seconds. Here we go. Okay, so we need to match the inequality with the graph we see here. It's a little bit tricky to see, but if we think of x as representing what the graph says, so x is what the graph says, x would include 2, and this is bolded in, but everything greater than 2. So the bolded in, the dot here that's filled in means x is equal to 2 or greater than. So we go down here and we go, uh, which choice makes sense? Um, this this choice here, D, says X is greater than or equal to 2. That is exactly what this bolded in dot followed by the bolded in line to the right of that represents. Next question, here we go, 60 seconds.
is the graph of the inequality x is less than 4. So I'm looking for, let's see, the number 4. Here it is. Uh, when there's no equal to, that means does not include 4. And that is indicated by a hollow dot or an unfilled in dot. So this one and this one are unfilled in. So this would mean x could be equal to 4 on this dot and this dot. So b and d are gone. Um, now I'm looking for a line bolded in to the left of 4, which, which represents everything less than 4. Um, and if we look at choice A here, clearly it's bolded in all the way to the left, which this would represent x is less than 4. And you can kind of see um, how that works. So choice A is where we're going to go with here.